we've been praying for revival. I thought it's also very interesting that you bring up that scripture about uh, Jesus is the foundation because that's what I want to preach on this morning or, or start with, should I say that. I've had so many things growing, going through my head and through my heart that hopefully I can get a bunch of it out and you'll grasp and glean something from it. He is the foundation stone on which everything is built. And of course, we know the story with, with uh, or I hope we know the story, most of us, we know the story about Peter that had the revelation when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter replied and says, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the one that's going to come to, to save us. And Jesus answered and said, blessed are you because you haven't got this from flesh and blood. This is a revelation from God. And the thing that God is still sending to the earth is revelation. He's still pouring out his spirit and bringing revelation to us. And he's building upon this foundation that Jesus is our saviour, that he is the one that has come to save us, that he did shed his blood for us. But there's more to this foundation that I want to break open for you a bit this morning. Is that okay? In, in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about a part of this foundation, if I can find Hebrews. That's not about a man making coffee. I'm a dad, you've got to let me have a few dad jokes. Okay, Hebrews chapter 6. It says this, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This we will do if God permits. There's seven principles here that are in the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. Christ is the foundation, and the whole rest of the book of Hebrews breaks open these truths of the seven principles of the doctrine of Christ. So what God has done through the ages is very, very interesting. You know, if I can give a little bit of church history here, do you mind if I just teach a little bit this morning? Is that okay? In, in church history, at the beginning we have, of course, Jesus came and the church was birthed, and Peter had the revelation and uh, that, that, you know, it's more than just the Jews. And so the, the church grew and it spread and there was persecution and all sorts of things happened. And that was what we call the diaspora and the dispersion out of Jerusalem. And, and the church was spread. And Jesus, of course, gave the Great Commission that we would go into all the world and make disciples of nations. And somehow or other we've lost the sight of that and turned it into making disciples of people. But Jesus wants us to disciple nations. And God has got a bigger picture. And I want to speak a bit big picture today, if I may. That God has got a big picture and wants to do a big thing. He doesn't want to do small stuff. He does big stuff that impacts on nations. So uh, after a few hundred years, Christianity had spread so much that the Emperor Constantine, after who we have the city Constantinople named, the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the state religion. And it became politically acceptable to be a Christian. It became the, the politically good thing to be a Christian. And somehow or other, the church lost a bit of its fire. Instead of being something that was out of a passion of walking with God and, and you know, with a bit of you know, opposition to it, it became the acceptable thing to do. And it lost its fire and became more of a political force rather than a belief system that's motivated with passion. And the whole world entered into what is called the Dark Ages for a thousand years. But God is going to have his way. In the 16th century, we have what is called the Great Reformation. And it was, uh, you know, one of the chief men that started this, of course, we know is um, Martin Luther, who had the revelation that the just shall live by faith. Remember the seven principles? Let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. So what God has done through the ages, if I can explain it like this, is bit by bit he has restored these truths to the church. 
his, and I believe there's more to come with these truths. Because he wants us to go on to maturity. He wants us to be mature as Christians. And that just does not mean old. Hello? <laughs> Any of those of us here are feeling a bit mature? It does not mean old, it means mature in Christ. Hello? So there's more to build on this revelation and God is breaking it open bit by bit to his church. So Martin Luther had this revelation, the just shall live by faith. And he challenged the church at the time who was very much a political entity and controlling people and, and you know, raising money. He began by criticizing things like the sale of indulgences which was a corrupt money-making scandal, insisting that the Pope had no authority over purgatory and the treasury of merit had no foundation in the Bible. You know, if I can tell a few little stories, we had a, a, a meeting in the pastor's fraternal in the town I was in, and we wanted to try and set some boundaries around who could join the fraternal because there were some interesting sort of uh, people coming into town. And we had... Very interesting discussions, trying to put some basis of uh, what we all believed, what we agreed upon. And we had real problem, particularly with the Catholics. Because one of the things that the Catholic minister said was that their tradition became their doctrine. And that's what's called syncretism, when you add things in that are not in the Bible. We had a lot of trouble with that. You know, we couldn't sort of rule him out. He was part of the fraternal, but we had trouble on that point. The tradition, Jesus, the Bible says that we shouldn't add or take away. Hello, are you with me? So Martin Luther was challenging the Catholic Church back in the 16th century about how they raised money and how they were just doing all this sort of stuff. And it began a great move of God, which became a reformation and the whole nation was changed and transformed and it actually begun what's called the renaissance with the increase of art and culture are you with me so the uh, the point that i'm trying to make is that there is more that god wants to do than just revival it actually transforms nations and god wants to transform australia i believe anyway don't, i don't want to get ahead of myself i want to make some points about how God does this and he also said um, the Reformation developed further to include a distinction between the law and the gospel and a complete reliance on scripture as the only source of doctrine the initial movement in Germany diversified and other reformers arose <clears throat> there was people like Zwingli and Zurich and Calvin in Geneva have you ever heard of Calvinism came from John Calvin and depending upon the country, the Reformation had varying causes and different backgrounds. The spread of, of Gutenberg's printing press provided the means for the rapid dissemination of religious materials. So the Bible was available to everybody rather than just to the clergy. And got, you know, they started to remove this distinction between the, the clergy and everybody else by the Bible and everybody and literacy became a common thing because they were able to get books out. Previous to that, they all had to be handwritten from scribes. And these days, you can just read a book on your phone. I've got a whole library in my pocket. It, it, the, the change, the renaissance, the development of science actually came because Christian men who believed that the God of creation is unchanging and immutable had developed the creation of God, which also must be unchanging and immutable. Therefore, we can have laws which are consistent. The scientific method came out of that. The scientific method is develop a theory and make a reproducible test that can confirm it. Science came from Christianity, came from this move of God. Are you hearing me? I mean, the, the development and where we are now is because of God's hand on the earth. Hello? This huge shift forward in culture was the result and an outworking of this fresh revelation in the move of God, which is why it is called Reformation. It reformed the whole world. It changed it. 
In America in the 1730s, there was a bunch of states that were loosely aligned. A man called Jonathan Edwards preached on the, this message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. That sounds pretty severe. If we put up a thing on our um, bulletin next week, this is going to be the message next week, sinners in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> all line up to come to that one. But when he preached that, people fell down in weeping and repentance and it began what is called the first great awakening. And many, many thousands were saved. The outcomes of that first great awakening was there was an increase in religious diversity. Many, many churches started. They were unified, the, the colonists in the colonies, and it became the foundation for the American Revolution and the break from English ties. You've got to understand the outworking of what happens when we have a revival. It changes a nation. I was in my car driving to, into town once, and I was believing for revival. And I was praying passionately. I might have told this story before. You can hear it again. God, give me revival. Give me revival. Give me revival. God, I want revival. And in my thinking, I'm thinking, as a pastor, I want my church to grow. That was really what I was thinking. God, I want my church to grow. But I was praying, God, give me revival. And God came into my car. And when the Spirit of God comes, He does what He wants. You know, the Bible says if we pray according to His will, He hears us. God came into my car. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord came in. And I had been convicted before, but this was a next level conviction. I was so convicted. I started repenting of things that I thought I had done. I repented of things that I had done, things that I thought had done, things that I thought I might do. I, I repented of everything. I repented for me, myself, and everybody else. I repented when the fear of the Lord comes. So when Jonathan Edward came and he preached on sinners in the hands of an angry God, the Spirit of God came. And that conviction comes with the fear of the Lord. You know, I've had several discussions with, with various people about this. And I've never been able to reproduce that or impart it or bring that, but yet I believe that's part of revival. So what happens now is that if we preach on that sort of message, we preach holiness and righteousness, we just come across as self-righteous and judgmental. If we, if we preach against this sin or that sin, that's how people hear us. See, we've got to have the presence of God come and touch people's hearts and lives. It's not just us to have a voice, but God has got to do something by His Spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? My own daughter, who I'd raised as a Christian, still going to church, she said, Dad, you're just judgmental. Because she'd never had that same encounter with the fear of the Lord, which has strongly defined my sense of right and wrong. We need the Spirit of God to do that. We need revival to come into our land, to bring the reformation, to bring a change. See, it's not just about us. It's about God coming. We are co-workers. We are the voice, but God has got to do it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We need revival. We need God to come. We need that Spirit to come. It's not just enough that we do something. Unless God does it, we're just spinning our wheels. Hello? Are you hearing where I'm going with this? That God is building something, but it is by His Spirit. At a similar time, in England, there was a man called John Wesley who had a revelation from God. He'd met with some people that had come out of these uh, 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 moves of the Spirit and uh, called them Moravians. And they had a hundred-year prayer meeting. 
They prayed together and gathered for a hundred years. Can you imagine going to one that long? Hello? There's generations of people praying. He met with these Moravians on a ship and it transformed his life. And he had an encounter with God. And he, he preached repentance and faith in Christ in England. He travelled 100,000 miles back and forwards in England on his horse. Poor old horse, he can't get out of that out of some cars. So it's a pretty good horse, I'd say. But the persecution was violent. Preachers were beaten, their houses damaged and sometimes firebombed. I've had a little bit of persecution, but nothing like that. I've had my roof rocked. I've had people have a go at me, but I haven't had that sort of persecution. But in the Wesleyan revival, he had this revelation that was based on small group gatherings that encouraged right living, self-discipline, and doing life by method. Hence the name of the church he established, the Methodists. And so George Whitfield, at the same time, was having a move of God and working in one of the great awakenings in America. And he was a great preacher and a great orator. And many people were being saved in America <coughs> through George Whitfield. But at the end of his life, he made the comparison between what he was doing and what Wesley was doing. He said Wesley had had this great move of God and established all these churches and Whitfield said, my disciples are like a rope of sand. They just disappeared because he didn't have that, how to build upon it. We've got to build on what God gives us. It's not enough just to have a meeting and have a nice gathering. We've got to build and work and be accountable with what gives, God gives us. I believe in this revival that there is an accountability upon us that to work and, and maintain what God gives us. Are you hearing me? Okay, so, so there are some principles here. The re reformation of the English culture became the ideological foundation for England to have an industrial revolution. This flow-on effect caused England to become the heart of a huge financial empire and the colonisation process that developed the Commonwealth, for which we are a part. Thus we have the Commonwealth spread across the globe. They say the sun never set on the Commonwealth. We are here because of the outworking of the move of God in England. Hello? We've got to understand that there's more that God wants to do. He wants to reform. Not just build and touch and save a few people and have a church, but God wants to bring a reformation. It changed the face of the globe, that Wesleyan revival. God is wanting to do more. I want you to, if you can, can you catch the big picture with me? That when we pray, we're praying for big stuff. We're praying for more. We're believing for revival, but revival is going to change Australia. I believe we need it. We absolutely need it. But part of these revivals has been re-establishing these foundation truths of the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The second great awakening in America was led by Charles Finney. He had a great singer who gathered people by the name of Ira Sankey, and he would hold a crowd and then Finney would preach. Finney also had a prayer warrior, this interests me, he had a prayer warrior who would go into towns where he was going to have his meetings uh, three weeks or a month before he got there, and this prayer warrior would prepare spiritually in that place. I would have loved to have been in those prayer meetings with that guy, to know how he prayed, believing God for this coming meeting. And when Finney would come to town, often people would fall in repentance even before they got to the meeting. The presence of God was tangible. That's what changes hearts and lives, is the presence of God. When Finney came to town, large camp meetings occurred. Uh, one famous camp meeting, there were between eight and 12,000 people just gathered with no advertising, no promotion. They all just gathered into this uh, wood, wooded area and people would get up and preach. There'd be a preacher on a stump over here with a bunch of people gathered around, another bunch over here around another preacher, another one over there. This lasted for days and days. And many, many people were touched by the Spirit of God as God did something sovereign in there, in this great awakening. Many people would...
fall to the ground and convulse and speak in tongues. This was in 1790 to 1840, this last, the Second Great Awakening. We often think of the, the Pentecostal movement as starting with the Azusa Street, but it was well around before then. This reform movement birthed the anti-slavery movement. It birthed women's suffrage and gave women the right to vote. Birth temperance meetings where people were, were, would sign temperance registers that say they would not drink and would not, you know, um, commit sins. It's amazing. In the early 1900s, there was a great move of God in Wales. A man by the name of Evan Roberts, who was also a prayer warrior, got up to preach and he was just allowed to preach to a small group. And the Spirit of God came into that place and birthed a revival in Wales. It only lasted for a couple of years. But in those two years, <coughs> 100,000 people were saved in Wales. And they say that Wales, is, of course, is, is a mining community. And the miners who had these you know, donkeys and horses working in the mines would totally have transformed lives. And they wouldn't, they'd stop swearing at the horses and the horses wouldn't know what to do. Because they didn't understand the language. It's a, it, God transformed that nation. I don't know if you've ever seen a, an old movie called How Green Was My Valley. I remember, the only thing I remember about that movie was about a Welsh family, was this father of this household was reading his newspaper, sitting in his lounge chair, and something happened that annoyed him, and he threw the newspaper down and said, sacrilege, blasphemy, and hypocrisy. And I thought it amazing that still decades later, the Welsh culture... Was, was presented as having no expletives. It had been removed out of the culture, and that was the worst he could do, was name some sins. Wouldn't it be great if Australia had a touch of God? You know any Australians that, you know... <laughs> Hello? It transformed cultures. That's what a move of God does. It transforms, it changes, it brings a reforming. That's why it's called Reformation. In the 50s or, or 40s, there was a move of God in Korea. It was down in the south of Korea, and God began to do something sovereign, and people began to get saved and touched by the Spirit of God. The four main denominations in Korea at the time got their heads together and said, we don't like this, we can't control it. So they tried to stop it. This is on record. Within a few weeks, North the invaded the South and the Korean War began. There is a responsibility to work with what God gives us. Now, I don't know whether it was because, you know, you can draw your own assumptions from that. But we're praying for revival and there is a responsibility to be accountable, to be good stewards. But God was not finished with Korea. There was a young man by the name of Yongi Cho. I don't know if you've heard of him. And God began to speak to him about how to receive specifically by faith and how to get answers from heaven. And he began to receive from God very, very specific prayer. The first thing he prayed for was an American-made bicycle. He didn't want a crappy Korean one. He wanted an American one with decent steel. And he got his bicycle. God gave it to him. And he worked hard and he built his church to two, three thousand people and he was burning out. And so he sought God about it. And God showed him and gave him this plan about developing church around small groups, about, about with groups of people with similar uh, backgrounds and similar cultures, similar ages, and he developed a church around homogeneous groups. And the church broke through all the growth barriers to the point where he got a million members eventually. The church, the Seoul Korea, this church, is a building that only seats 10,000 people. They have multiple services all weekend, and their members are told they're only allowed to attend once a month because they can't fit them all in. But that breakthrough that he had transformed Korea to the point where instead of it becoming a typically poverty-stricken Asian nation, righteousness exalts a nation. 
that nation became so financially prosperous and flourishing that now they have problems of a wealthy, industrialised nation. Many of us drive Hyundai. That's because of what God did in that nation. I mean, a few decades ago, that would have been unthinkable that we would drive an Asian car if it wasn't Japanese. But God did a number in Korea. And many, many churches there now in the tens and hundreds of thousands. And when Yongi chose church, they would plant a church, they'd start by giving them 25,000 people. That's a way to plant a church. <laughs> We've got to understand that God brings this reformation. The problems in Korea now are those of a wealthy nation. They say that Korea has the highest per capita percentage of um, plastic surgery. That often for their 16th or 18th birthday, the young ladies will get a gift of plastic surgery. The problems are no longer just with survival, but with vanity and materialism. But the outworking is because God has blessed that nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. God has given us a wonderful nation here in Australia. And this is what I'm getting to, that we need revival because we need a reformation and we want God to work in our nation. There are outcomes of revival that work. It changes the dynamic. When God comes, when God comes, in the third great awakening, in the 1850s, just a few decades after the Second Great Awakening in America. The church had lost its ability to impact the nation. And I look at it, the church now and I think, have, have we still got the ability to impact our nation? We're called as a church to have a voice to our nation. And I sometimes wonder, God, how are we going to get there? How are we going to do it? We've got the technology now that we can do it, but God has got to open that door. He's got to open that pathway. I, I believe that we do that. There are a lot of churches now just reading a, a promotion of another church this morning. Come and join the fun. There's pancakes for the kids and jumping castles and coffee for the adults. And people are flocking there and I think, God, is this what we have come to? Where the message is not life changing but life coaching. We need revival. We need God to come. Can you hear the heart of God in this? We need a reformation. God is, a, is the one that changes lives. He's changed mine. There's, there's these principles that God wants to restore. In the third great awakening, there was a young man who just wanted to pray in around the, the Wall Street, the financial area in America, and he put up some posters that says, I'm having a prayer meeting from 12 to 1. And he went and he prayed there. He hired a hall above a church, and he went and he prayed, and uh, uh, he thought he was on his own. After about 20 minutes, half a dozen other men came in and prayed with him. They thought, this is great. So they put up some more posters. Within a few months, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people coming to these noon prayer meetings, praying from 12 to 1. Businesses closed between 12 to 1 to come and pray. And it began the third great awakening. See, God birthed something in prayer. And as a church, we are called to be people who pray. Neil has been asking for us to have a spirit of prayer, and I believe we should, because the outworking is tremendous when it changes the nation, when the nation is transformed by the move of God. That's what we call to, friend. It's changed America. And America had this incredible move of God where hundreds of thousands of people got saved. But America, it's the same time that it had a civil war. And they say that in the south, around the Confederate campfires, hundreds of thousands of men got saved as the gospel was shared because of the move of God. And then they went and died in the civil war, half a million men. And God moved and swept many into the kingdom. I don't know what the cost will be for us to have revival, but we need it. We need it, we need it. We need it. Are you getting something out of this this morning? Uh, you know, I just want to share my heart for where we're going and what God has got us to do. That it's more than just, it's so much more. 
one of the foundations that he brought with a charismatic move was laying on of hands and impartation. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe it. We do it every week. Lay on a hand, pray for the sick, impartation, believe God. When, when uh, we had a move of God in the 90s, I remember the, the, we went to a pastor's conference and, and so, they were praying for us and the, the presence of God was so powerful and so strong. You know, it's like the Bible says the word glory means weight. And the weight of his presence came into that room with a, with a couple of hundred pastors. We are all just lying on the floor under the weight of his presence. I remember lying there feeling like I was going to leave an imprint on the floor from the weight of his presence. And after you lie there for half an hour or an hour under the weight of the presence of God, it actually gets really uncomfortable. I remember the pastor next to me saying, I'm going to die. This is, this is the presence of God. It transforms us. Do you remember those times? The presence of God comes. See, the, the next thing in that list of the principles of the doctrine of Christ is resurrection from the dead. And I believe there's more to this than just we're going to be resurrected at the last day, although I'm looking forward to that. Here's the thing. The wages is just a thought. You know, I, this is not a full explanation of this theology, but just, just a thought. God is taking us to maturity with these principles. He wants us to mature and enter in. So we grow up into all things in the head who is Christ, that we may fulfill all in all and grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, into the fullness of his image. As we repent from dead works, faith towards God, doctrine of baptisms, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit, laying on of hands, and resurrection from the dead. The wages of sin is death. But if I'm in Christ, Jesus has died for me, he is my righteousness, therefore I do not I should not receive the wages of sin. Death has no legal right. And what's happened is, as, as God reveals truths to his church, the church begins to embrace it. Some do, some don't. And as we embrace the truths, we grow in faith with it, and then the outworking comes, brings reformation. And I believe there's more in this to unpack. That as God comes by his spirit, and brings open the revelation of Christ and who we are. Corinthians says, when we see him, we'll become like him. And as we see more of who he is, and we step into our identity in him, rather than from works, you see, inheritance comes to identity, it doesn't come from works. As we step into our identity in Christ, we are joint heirs with him and we can receive the inheritance. Are you hearing me? There is so much more in this. I'm just trying to, I hope I'm not going too deep for you. The last enemy to be defeated is death. Jesus called death an enemy. So if it's an enemy, and we're in the one who holds the keys of hell and death, then we can overcome it. Just a thought. There is more to come as the church embraces the fresh touch of heaven. The whole of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. We need a revival. We need a revival. Our nation needs a reformation, needs a transformation. I have a vision of the kingdom of heaven coming to Australia. I believe him for it. I'm asking God for it. To see people not just saved, but our nation transformed. As we're the salt of the earth. You got it right, Jason. We are the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be the salt, but if the salt has lost its savour, what good is it? We're supposed to be salt. Can you put that thing up there? Coming soon. I, I Just on my heart to do some training sessions on Thursday nights and so we can grow in God. As part of this, we'll do a bit of theology, but also a whole bunch of other stuff, some really practical things of how we can have influence, of how we can walk with God, of how we can 
uh, embrace all that God has for us. Part of it will be we'll have encounter sessions, we'll do a whole bunch of different things on a Thursday night and uh, you know it's part of how I'm wired. So I want to offer that and open that to us as a church and we'll be having that as the hub. Well, I thought we'd call it salt because we're supposed to be the salt. We're supposed to bring reformation. We're supposed to bring change. We're supposed to bring that life. As Jesus comes and works his life in us and the transforming power of God flows through us and flows out through all those around us. Hello? Uh, I'm just trying to encourage us into a big picture here. That there is so much more. The like what Sharon's doing, just going to make a difference. Just something, but going to make a difference. We can make a difference. And if we're, we're not good at talking to people, we can pray. If we're not good at praying, we can talk to people. We can do something. <laughs> we can do something to make a difference. The kingdom of God. God is not finished with us, I absolutely believe absolutely believe as we step into maturity as we step into all that he has for us as we grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ god has more so abundantly more that we can ask or think but it starts with a touch of heaven starts with a revival starts when god comes and brings a transformation to our nation it's only got to start with a few all these things that i spoke about today just started with a few but yet ended up transforming nations and transformed the world. God is going to have his way. It's not that we should wait to be taken out of the place. We're supposed to bring heaven to earth. My eternity started when I got born again. Somebody asked me today, you know, um, I forget what you asked me, but I said I, was, I, was, I started, I was born in 1982. That's when I was born again was birthed into my eternal walk. My spirit walk started then. This body is playing up a little bit. I'm believing for it to be healed. But my spirit walk has already started. And one day I may step out of this body and step into that eternal realm, step out of this one, but I'm already there. And you are too. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your encouragement. I thank you, Father, that you'll help us lift our vision into that which you want to do, the great move of God by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name.